the grass just to make things interesting that uh, in one of the sections there she is I've got different times on different machines what time is have you got three sharp five to three <laughs> <laughs> two minutes past three yeah three sharp okay well, we're not sharp in this place. We always do this. No, oh, she'll be right. Relax. So we'll probably wait for a few minutes before we actually begin this suit of class. <coughs> and just in, just in general, I hope everything's going okay. And that the... Uh, uh, the retreat is developing, giving enough advice. I'm going to try to, again, finish off with a guided meditation this afternoon. Is that okay with the people? They would like to have some, a bit of uh, guidance. But if you don't, then just you know, put it on the, uh, the mach on the piece of paper for the evening. Ready? Okay. So this is connected discourses with chitta. Now chitta, the chitta, the word is sometimes uh, used to refer to the mind. The uh, the uh, same is the the sixth sense, if you like, and it's also it's a word which is used to mean sort of something beautiful. In fact, there was a prince chitra who uh, was a Thai prince many years ago, and he was the one who sent his troops into northern Malaysia, where he founded the, the town of Chitra. In, where's that, Kida, no, Kedar, is it? The Malaysians here? No, not Kotobar, the other side. Uh, in Kedar, yeah. Yeah, I thought it was Kedar. So I must actually um, say that, because I go to... Malaysia so many times. I was going to a conference, one, a big international conference, and the Malaysian delegation, they had the big Malaysian flag on the steps of the convention to take the official photograph of the Malaysian delegation to this big international Buddhist conference. And I just happened to be walking past, and they said, Ajahn Brahm, come over here. They said, Brahm from Australia. Ah, no, you're one of us. So they got me over and I had my a photo taken in front of the big Malaysian flag for the official delegation <laughs> from Malaysia. <laughs> so I thought that was really cool, I was very honoured. But anyway, um, so Chitta is also the name of a, of a household. He wasn't a monk, but he was incredibly wise as you will soon find out. But it's also what happens when monks uh, tend to uh, just speak a little too much and they're considered to be wise and holy as well. So, uh, well, I want to go down to number three, first of all, Isidata. Are you okay? Number three. Then Chitta the householder approached. Okay? Then Chitta the householder approached the elder monks, paid homage to them, sat down to one side and said to the venerable chief elder, the head monk, Venerable elder, there are various views that arise in the world. The world is eternal, not eternal, is finite, is infinite. The soul and the body are the same, or the soul is one thing and the body is another. The Buddha exists after death or it does not exist after death or the Buddha both exists and does not exist after death, or the Buddha neither exists nor does not not exist after death. If ever you have been to India and had a conversation, sometimes every possible permutation and some permutations you never even thought of before, they can actually just go through all of those and sometimes afterwards you wonder what the heck you're talking about. <laughs> but it doesn't really matter here that these are so many different views about existence and life after death and the ultimate reality. 
These as well as the Sikhti views mentioned in the Brahmacharya Sutta, that's the first sutta in the, uh, the Adhika Nikaya, the long, uh, long uh, discourses of the Buddha. And the Brahmacharya means the net of Brahma. So it was the origin, the first time they had the idea of an internet, the Brahma Jala, the net of Brahma. Maybe you don't agree with that? No, okay. I do try to put something interesting into these very dense uh, pieces of suttas. When this was said, so uh, the rise in the world, they said, when what exists do these different views come to be? When what is non-existent do these views not come to be? Now straight away here, now that question, what is the cause of all these views? And what, when that cause has vanished, do these ideas also just not appear? Now this is a powerful little question, because this cuts to the heart goes to the heart of the Buddha's teaching, cause and effect. When something is, then an effect happens. And when that uh, cause disappears, then the effect disappears. So anyway, when this question was said, the Venerable Chief Elder was silent. The second and third time, Chitta the household asked the same question. And the second and third time, the Venerable Chief Elder was silent. Now on that occasion, the Venerable Isidatta was the most junior monk in that Sangha. Then the Venerable Isidatta said to the Venerable Chief Elder, Allow me, Venerable Elder, to answer Chitta the householder's question. Answer it, friend Isidatta. Now, householder, are you asking thus? Venerable Elder, there are various views that arise in the world. And uh, when now, when what exists, do these views come to be? When what is non-existent, do these views not come to be? And said, uh, yes, Venerable Sir, that was a question. As to those various views that arise in the world, householder, or when there is identity view, the idea of there's a self, a me in here, then these views come to be. And when there is, uh, when no, is, sorry, when there is no identity view, no sense of self to these views not come to be. But, Venerable Sir, how does ven identity view come to be? The idea of a me, a mine, a self. Here, householder, the uninstructed worldling who has no regard for noble ones, unschooled and undisciplined in their dharma, uh, they regard form, uh, that's uh, stuff, your body, as a self, or a self-possessing form, or form as somehow in self, or self as somehow to be found in form. Regards the feeling, the, the sense of um, experience, perception, will, volition formations, or consciousnesses as self, or self as possessing consciousness, or consciousness as within self, or self as within consciousness, in such a way that identity view comes to be. And Venerable Sir, how does identity view, the perception of the idea of a me and a minor self, not come to be? Here, householder, the uninstructed noble disciple, the instructed noble disciple, uh, does not regard the body or form as a self, or self as possessing a body, or body as somehow within the self. I know there's some huge uh, infinite cosmic consciousness and the body is within it, or self as in form. They do not regard experience as self, or perception as self, or will as self, or consciousness as self, or self as in consciousness. It is in such a way that identity view does not come to be which is, you know, the correct answer, which was, uh, Chitta was very happy with that. So that junior monk, if you want to know more about that answer later on, but that's the idea of like, um, who are you? Do you exist? 
What is this idea of me, mine, and self? Ah, this is the, the uh, teaching of the five skandhas, the five components of existence. This uh, person sitting in front of me, what are they? Uh, spit them up into the body and all that stuff called uh, your hair and your flesh and your brain. Is that you? And obviously that's not you. Is the, the somehow the soul somehow inside of you. Is it they cut you up and the soul comes out? No? You mean you've got no soul? I remember when I was um, a young man, and that used to be one of the types of music, they had rock and roll and soul music. <laughs> <laughs> As a young man. Anyway, um, so what about your experience? Or is it in your perceptions, or your will, is the will? Is it yourself, your soul possesses a will? Or is your soul within a greater will? Or is it the same? Or is it different? So, and consciousness, the knower, is that you? Or is it your your sense of self possesses consciousness. So, these are the forms of self, you and the Isidata said, when those things have been seen through for what they really are, then you don't have all these views. Interesting. But anyway, the Chitta was very impressed. Where does Master Isidata come from? I come from Avanti householder, which is a long way away from the Ganges Valley. There, there is, Venerable Sir, a clansman, means a relation. There's a relation from Avanti, one of my relations, called Isidatta, an unseen friend of ours who has gone forth. Has the Venerable One ever met him? Yes, householder. Where is that Venerable One now dwelling, Venerable Sir? And when this was said, Venerable Isidata was silent. Is the master Isidata? Yes, older. Yes, householder. Oh, then let Master Isidata delight in a delightful wild mango grove at Machi Kasanda. That was uh, the monastery where Chitta, the householder, he supported it. I will be zealous in providing Master Isidata with robes, arms, food, lodgings, and medicinal requisites. The basic four uh, needs of a, actually of a human being, but especially uh, for a, um, a monastic, the four requisites. As long as you've got enough robes, arms, food, lodgings, and uh, medicine in times of sickness, what more do you want? This is kindly said, householder. Then Chitta the householder, having delighted and rejoiced in Venerable Isidata's words, with his own hands served and satisfied the elder monks with the various kinds of delicious food. When the elder monks had finished eating and put away the bowls and rose from their seats and departed, then the venerable chief elder said to the venerable Isidata, it is good, friend Isidata, that the answer to this question occurred to you. The answer did not occur to me. Therefore, friend Isidata, whenever a similar question comes up some other time, you should clear it up. The result of that, Venerable Isidata set his lodging in order and taken bowl and robe, he left Machika Sunda. When he left Machika Sunda, he left for good and never returned. Why do you think he never returned? It was because that, you know, he gave a, a good answer to a deep question which the elder monk did not understand. And also, that meant that he did not, Isidata did not want to be famous and basically outdo the senior monk and become something special. Any monk, if they, you know, they sometimes they're good monks, but if they, they, uh, their reputation increases too much, they disappear and leave and don't come back as the second story, which is a little bit more interesting, will tell you. Mahaka's miracle. But I do like that little story. 
because I think it was the same international conference with a Malaysian flag, as it happened to be, jogs my memory. It was in uh, Vietnam. I think one of the United Nations Days of WASAC. They celebrated. So I got my invitation to go there as well. And that I like going to conferences because at conferences, you know, you, you know you're not always sitting in the front giving the answer to all the questions or giving uh, the talk. Sometimes you can sit in the back and listen to, to other people say things. So I was sitting in the back, minding my own business and just waiting for this presentation to occur, which I was interested in. And then another Vietnamese monk sat next to me and you know, he was, could speak very good English, this Vietnamese monk. And uh, we just had a nice conversation. And he said to me, he said, oh, where are you from? I was very really impressed with his English. And I said, oh, I'm from Australia. Oh, you're from Australia, said this Vietnamese monk. Have you heard of this monk called Ajahn Brahm? <laughs> <laughs> this actually happened. I said, yeah, I've, I've heard of him. Have you met him? You know, you try and play it up as much as you possibly can. <laughs> and, then he, and then I said, I am Ajahn. Ah! But that's what he did. He almost jumped out of his seat. Oh, that's, another, that's a bit mean for me to play like things like that. Because, you know, well, like monks, we're just monks, that's all. We don't sort of try and show off. It was just like the Buddha himself, the story. It's not here, but it's in one of the, the uh, other suttas. Oops, what have I done? Okay, well, I'll find it back again in a moment. The, this other monk, um, he was also a travelling monk, and when he was travelling, he, because he was, um, this monk, it was a long time ago, in the Buddha's time, he was ordained uh, by one of the Buddha's disciples. And that after completing basic training, that uh, he asked his teacher, he'd never seen the Buddha before, can he just go off and just uh, uh, to meet the Buddha? And of course, the disciple of the Buddha, this uh, monk's teacher, said, yes, of course, please do so. But travelling in those days, you know, it actually did mean that you uh, had to um, walk. So it was days and days. Uh, but for a monk, a wandering monk, you could find always many, many diff uh, different places to stay, either in the jungles or in just little um, uh, places set aside for everybody to stay the night. Even when I was a monk, there was always these like little halls, salas, in every village, so that if any visitor came, they could always uh, sleep there. It was under cover, and you'd always be provided with a mattress, not mattress, but a, a little mat and a, a pillow to, for you to sleep on. And so travel in those days was very easy, especially if you were a monk. Any monastery where you went to, you'd always uh, have a bed for the night. It was like, you know, you're a member of like some huge club, like some diner's club or, or <laughs> stuff where you always had free accommodation and always have a meal. It was actually quite, quite nice. So anyway, this monk, you know, he's, hadn't finished the journey yet, was still a ways away from the Ganges Valley, but he went to a, um, some a person's house and he said, it's all right if I spend the night in your workshop. And the owner said, yes, yeah, certainly. He found some straw for this monk, and so the monk could actually stay the night. A, a little time afterwards, oh, there you go. little time afterwards, that he, um, another monk came in. And the other monk said, is it okay if, if I share the workshop with you? Because it's a big workshop. Yeah, sure, said the, um, the first monk. And the first monk just you knows not yet time to go to rest, and so the first monk was meditating. And so the second monk meditated as well. And then when the first monk sort of you know, would have come out of his meditation and, and gone to sleep, he saw this other monk still, still meditating, so he thought, well, I'd better meditate as well. So the two of them, they meditated all night. And in the morning, when they came out of the meditation and they had to sort of get their bowls ready to go on arms round, the second, the second monk said, oh, you know, you, you meditate really well. Now, who, who's your teacher? 
And the, the first monk said, oh, my teacher is one of the, the great disciples of, you know, of the Buddha. And he said, I, I, and I've taken the opportunity to, to take leave of that, uh, my teacher, so I can see the Buddha myself. Oh, very good monk. You, know, you meditate well, and your teacher is a very good monk. And then the, the young monk asked his elder monk, so well, who's your teacher? And that monk who came in second uh, uh, after him, he said, I don't have a teacher. You don't have a teacher? I'm the Buddha, he said. Ah! <laughs> I've been spent all night <laughs> meditating with the Buddha. And I haven't bowed or done any service. Well, it's okay, you don't need to do that. And I, there's a lovely little story. Number one, the Buddha looked like every other monk in that time. He couldn't tell the difference. He didn't wear, you know, they said he had golden robes, but <laughs> people didn't sort of um, notice that. And didn't have any sort of, uh, not, not the sort of spiky head. <laughs> because he couldn't recognize him. And it was a very, I lo really loved that story. And just the humility, oh, it's okay, the Buddha, the boss, was asking, is it okay if I can sleep on here as well, share this workshop? Yeah, sure. And that's the sort of humility, the ordin ordi ordinariness in the sense of appearance. And the lack of uh, pomp or uh, saying just how good you are that uh, the Buddha exhibited. So I kind of like the fact that physically the Buddha never stood out. But just another monk could disappear and vanish. It's only when he spoke did the power of his attainments, or his rather disappearance, really come forth. So anyway, that was the, the Buddha, and I lost my page again as usual. So, Mahaka's miracle, here we go on this one. On one occasion, a number of elder monks dwelling at Machi Kasanda in the wild mango grove and then Chitta, the householder, approached those elder monks, paid homage to them, sat down to one side and said to them, Venerable sirs, let the elders consent to accept tomorrow's meal from me in my cow shed. Now, if you invited me to your cow shed for lunch, <laughs> <laughs> I might think twice. <laughs> but as I mentioned already, you know, the cows were very special. In, uh, in India at the time, and also that that was a very nice place to invite the monks to have their food, believe it or not. Uh, then the elder monks consented by silence, and Chitta the householder, having understood that the elders had consented, rose from his seat, paid homage to, the, homage to them, keep, and departed, keeping them on his right. When the night had passed. In the morning, the elder monks dressed, took their bowls and outer robes, and went to the cow shed of Chitta the householder. There they sat down on the appointed seats. Then Chitta the householder, with his own hand, served and satisfied the elder monks with delicious milk rice made with ghee. When the elder monks had finished eating and put away their bowls, they rose from their seat and departed. Then Chitta the householder, having said, give away the remainder, that was, you know, to these uh, helpers, followed close behind the elder monks you know, as they were returning to the monastery. Now on that occasion, the heat was sweltering and the elders went along as if their bodies were melting because of the food they'd eaten. Hot weather and rich food and old monks. So, <laughs> as if their bodies were melting. Now on that occasion, the Venerable Mahaka was the most junior monk in that Sangha. Then the Venerable Mahaka said to the Venerable Chief Elder, It would be good, Venerable Elder, if a cool wind would blow and a canopy of clouds would form and the sky would drizzle. That would be good, friend said the chief elder. Then the venerable Mahaka performed such a feat of spiritual power 
that a cool wind did blow, and a canopy of clouds formed, and the sky drizzled. Then it occurred to Chitta the householder, such is the spiritual power and might possessed by the most junior monk in this Sangha. Wow! Then when the Venerable Mahaka arrived at the monastery, he said to the Venerable Chief Elder, Is this much enough, Venerable Elder? That's enough, Ven Mahaka. What's been done is sufficient, Ven Mahaka. What's been offered is sufficient. Then the elder monks went to their dwellings, and the Venerable Mahaka went to his own dwelling. Then Chitta the householder approached the Venerable Mahaka, paid homage to him, sat down to one side and said to him, He'll be good, Venerable Sir, if Master Mahaka would show me a superhuman miracle of spiritual power. He's already seen one, but you know, that clouds forming and drizzle, cool wind, maybe that's just coincidence. So show me a spiritual power, psychic power. Yes, Venerable Sir, Chitta the Householder, sorry, then householder, said the monk, spread your cloak upon the veranda and scatter a bundle of grass upon it. Yes, venerable sir, Chitta the householder replied, and he spread his cloak upon the veranda and scattered a bundle of grass upon it. Then, when, it, when uh, this monk Mahaka entered the, his dwelling and shut the bolt, the venerable Mahaka performed a feat of spiritual power such as a flame shot through the keyhole and the chink of the door and burnt the grass, but not the cloak. Chitta the householder shook out his cloak and stood to one side, shocked and terrified. Then Venerable Mahaka came out of his dwelling and said to Chitta the householder, is this much enough, householder? That's enough! <laughs> Venom Mahaka, what's been done is sufficient, Venom Mahaka. What's been offered is sufficient. Let Master Mahaka delight in the delightful wild mango grove at Machika Sanda. I will be zealous in providing Master Mahaka with robes, arms, food, lodging, and medicinal requisites. That is kindly said, householder. Then the Venom Mahaka set his lodging in order. And taking bowl and robe, he left Machika Sanda. When he left Machika Sanda, he left for good and never returned. That's what happens if you show off psychic powers. Because <laughs> what would happen is people would keep coming there and say, oh, please show me another one. So that's, <laughs> that's not the job of a monk. Now, those are stories actually from the time of, uh, of the, the Buddha. But it did so happen that when I was, uh, went to Wat Pa Pong, uh, that was in 1974, 5 or something, that there was this, I don't know, he was, a, he was a Thai monk, he wasn't senior, he wasn't junior, but he came to the hall one morning and he bowed to, first of all to Ajahn Chah, and every other monk in that refectory, there was probably about 50 monks there, including me, and I was only such a junior, I think, monk, and then he left, put his bowl and robe together and disappeared. Because what had happened just earlier, this monk said he had, could have the psychic power of hearing conversations a long way away. So in other words, he could be, say, at, well, to give you some idea, at Bodhinyana Monastery, and he could tell what you were talking about in the, in the dining room here. And that's one of the psychic powers, you know, which you can develop through, through meditation. And the, he said he could do it. And if any monk claims to have such a power like that, it has to be checked out, because if you are lying about it, that's a disrobal offence. You know, you have to leave the monkhood. It's like sexual intercourse or killing a human being or stealing. So the Buddha said, if you lie about those things, you're out. So, this monk, they had to check him out. They did a test for him. They went off to the market, which was about six kilometers away, and they checked out, you know, what did this person say, what did I say? And it was actually true. Yet he had this power. 
Now what happened next was a fascinating, this was just before I arrived, what happened next was fascinating, very similar to the story of Devatata, because once you have those spiritual powers, if you are not really enlightened or have some understanding that this is not your attainment, it doesn't belong to you, you get proud, arrogant, conceited, you think you are something, you've got some powers. So this monk, he actually liked Devadatta in the stories. He thought he was something. And one morning he sat in Ajahn Chah's chair as if he was as good as Ajahn Chah, or even better. Arrogance got the better of him, conceit. And Ajahn Chah was such a skilled monk, he just said, come upstairs. And he went up to his private quarters, you know, and those private quarters, nothing there, it's just an empty room. But only just towards the end of my time with Ajahn Chah, he invited me up to his quarters, not to actually to, to test me out on anything, he just wanted something from his room. And I was, it was the first time I'd been in that private quarters of Ajahn Chah. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. What is my teacher really like? What has he actually got in his room? And I recall that with such huge amounts of faith and inspiration. At this time, Ajahn Chah, he was, oh, kings and queens, well, not the king never came to see him until after he died, but queens would come, major generals would come, really wealthy people would come to see him. And whatever he wanted, he would just, people would just fall over themselves offering it to him. He went out to his room. And I remember there was a straw mat, a wooden pillow, and there was, I think, one robe on the line. It was empty. His room had nothing in it. And to see such a senior, famous monk have hardly any possessions, even his pillow was a wooden pillow. And he was old. There was no bed, he just slept on the floor. And I thought, no mattress, just on the floor. And I thought, wow, how fortunate it is to be uh, a student of such a monk. And how inspiring that was to see, you know, personally, what he owned, or rather, how little he owned, what he had in his own room. So it was uh, really amazing. So anyway, so this uh, monk thought he had the equivalent powers to, or at least better wisdom than Ajahn Chah, sat in his seat, and Ajahn Chah took him upstairs and talked to him, and you know, basically explained to him but just having psychic powers does not mean you're enlightened. You know, he made a mistake there, owning those powers. And so the monk the next day bowed to everybody, put his robes and bowl uh, on his shoulders, and then left. Just like in the suttas here, we never saw him again. Not sure where he went, but probably he took those powers further and eventually became one of the Arahats. He had all those good qualities. This monk, who I only just saw, was at the beginning of my time with Ajahn Chah. Psychic powers do exist. And if I got one of the monks here to show, would you like to see a psychic power? <laughs> You'd be terrified. No, 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 I wouldn't. Yes, you would. Because this also happened. You, you, that might be telling these stories. They're interesting, aren't they? <laughs> this is what people want to hear about. <laughs> but it, these happened. And I don't mind saying about this monk because I think many of the Indonesian meditators here might have met him. He was called Sudamo. He ordained as a monk. Uh, he was, oh, must be about my age, maybe a little bit older. But he uh, decided to be like a Rishi like a hermit. So he went in some of the jungles in Java, when there were jungles in Java, <laughs> it is so developed now, <laughs> concrete jungle mostly, <laughs> but he went into those jungles, uh, actually there's still a few jungles up in the mountains, but there he, um, he went uh, there just to, to meditate and just to be in solitude. And you know, he spoke really good English, well educated, and you know, I remember talking with him. He told me his story. 
His English wasn't perfect, as you will soon find out in a minute, because the way he described his experience of getting to a jhana. Because he said he was sitting there uh, in the jungles, and you know, obviously with his eyes closed, and he said this star just came right to him. You know, classic nimitta. And instead of saying that, you know, he's just, he just um, uh, absorbed into that light, or the light just enveloped him, I just like the way he mentioned it, because his English is not his first language. He said he married that star. <laughs> I thought it was such a really cute and wonderful little way of saying it. You know, you totally united, became one with that star, married it, he said. And then, sort of when he came out of his meditation, that the jungle was different, which was weird. And then he asked the villagers, once he came out, you know, because the village was a little walk away, and he said, well, what happened? He said, you were sitting there? I said, yeah, because it was a flood. And he worked out the reason it looked different, because you could see all the marks of the, of the trees which had fallen over, and the branches which had uh, come off. And he'd been submerged for days under those flood waters. Perfectly fine. Because in those jhanas, you do become kind of invulnerable. And there he was, submerged. Didn't know anything about it, just blissing out inside. So the only reason I can tell about that monk is he passed away quite a few years ago. If he was still alive, I wouldn't say anything. Because you'd all go and find out, where is he? You'd probably <laughs> just go Google him or something. or he, but, and that would just bother. So we'd never actually say about monks who are still alive, about their powers. But because he, you know, he ordained in the Thai Dhamma Yuta tradition, I used to see him over in, in Wat Bawan in the last years of his life. And of course, you know, he decided, no, he was actually asked to actually to do a weekly meditation lesson you know, in English. Because even the Thai monks, I don't know why, but their English was not that really clear. And his was clear, and obviously he knew how to meditate. But one of my, my friends uh, knew her really well. She was actually a, a mom Luang. I said, well, was it? Yeah, right, well, she was granddaughter of one of the Thai kings. And anyway, she, she was, so went to that class, and she told me that one day she was meditating, and she felt that something was going on, something weird. She could feel that the energy of the room was woo. And she opened her eyes and she told me, no exaggeration, she said she saw these laser lights coming out of this monk's eyes into one of the other meditators there. You know, just you know, like in the movies, but this was real. And just, I don't know, I've never seen those movies. The people have laser lights coming out of their eyes in the, what's it called, Avengers? Someone was talking about that the other day. <laughs> the mark with laser eyes. But <laughs> anyway, this was real. I don't, she had you know, been to many meditations before. But you know what she did? She got up, ran out, and never went back. You may think that, wow, I wish I could see one of these things. But they're really scary. If you see these things, that's another reason why monks don't, or nuns, or anyone doesn't do these things. So anyway, that's why he ran away. Woo. Anyway, oh my God, I can't go. Uh -oh. Okay, well, I think I'll get this back again. The psychic power, I wish I had the psychic power of knowing how to use internet, or, or computers, <laughs> not pressing the wrong thing. Ah. Uh, Okay, so I'm going to go down a bit because I really get into this too much. Um, we go down to... Okay, now we go down to number eight, which is an interesting one. And you know that sometimes I say that, you know, if I ask you a question, don't have an answer, because it's always a trick question. <laughs> <laughs> So, this is following on almost like a Buddhist tradition. This is Niganta Nataputta, 
And this is another weird coincidence of this world. Niganta Nataputta was no other than Mahavira, the person who started the Jains. And the Jaina tradition is still very strong in this world today. And it was really, I don't know why, that Mahavira, otherwise known as Niganta Nataputta, uh, was uh, living in Nalanda, where Sariputta was born, that uh, they were con he was contemporary to the Buddha, I think a little bit older than the Buddha, and they had to start of these two great Indian religions in the same part of India at the same time. And you know, they're still going strong today. And that was just such a coincidence. But anyway, that's historical records say that, that that's what was happening. But also, the two of them never met, which was also strange. But anyway, this is a story about Nigantanataputta, and the reason I'm reading this out now is also, you know, just to show you just about the idea of thought. And you may have, you know, assumed it's so difficult to stop your wandering mind and thinking, and, and some people even say today, said, well, look, you can't stop thinking, it's part of the mind. And what you hear here is really interesting. Now, on that occasion, Niganta Nataputta had arrived in Machikasanda together with a large retinue of Jains. Jitta, the householder, heard about this and, together with a number of lay followers, approached Niganta Nataputta. He exchanged greetings with Niganta Nataputta, and when they had included their greetings and cordial talk, he sat down to one side. And that is code for that uh, Mahavira was respectful of, Mah of, of Mah sorry, Chitta was respectful of Niganta Nataputta, but not a disciple. And Niganta Nataputta then said to him, Householder, do you have faith in the ascetic Gotama, which is how people who weren't followers of the Buddha uh, are called, and that's his designation, his name the ascetic Gotama, the Samana Gotama. Do you have faith in the ascetic Gotama when he says there is a concentration, like a stillness, a state of samadhi, without thought and examination? There is a cessation of thinking? In this matter, Venerable Sir, said Chitta, I do not go by faith in the Blessed One when he says there is a concentration without thought and examination. There is a cessation of thought and examination. When this was said, Niganta Nataputta looked up proudly towards his own retinue and said, See this, sirs? How straightforward is this Chitta, the householder? How honest and open. You know, he was a well-known follower of the Buddha and he was saying he doesn't believe what the Buddha said. One who thinks that thought and examination can be stopped might imagine he could catch the wind in a net or arrest the current of the river Ganges with his own fist. And then, Chitta the householder said, What do you think, Venerable Sir? Which is superior, knowledge, direct experience, or faith? Knowledge, householder, is much superior to faith. Well, Venerable Sir, to whatever extent I wish, Secluded from the five senses, from an unwholesome states, I can enter and dwell in the first jhana, which is accompanied by this movement of the mind uh, and, uh, and the uh, holding on to the mind. That's the other meaning of Vitaka Vichara, of what they translate here as thought and examination. To whatever extent I wish, with the subsiding of thought and examination, I enter upon and dwell in the second jhana, the third jhana, the fourth jhana. Since I know and see this for myself, venerable sir, in what other ascetic or Brahmin uh, need I place faith regarding the claim that there is a concentration without thought and examination, a cessation of thought and examination? In other words, I don't have faith in the Buddha about this. I know it for myself. When this was said, Nigantanataputta, 
looked askance at his own retinue and said, see this, sirs, how crooked is this shit of the householder? How fraudulent and deceptive. Just now, venerable sir, we understood you to say, see this, sir, how straightforward is this chitter, the householder, how honest and open. Yet now we understand you to say, see this, sirs, how crooked is this chitter, the householder, how fraudulent and deceptive. If your former statement is true, venerable sir, then your latter statement is false. Well, if your former statement is false, then your latter statement is true. <laughs> And then, for further, Venerable Sir, these ten reasonable questions came up. And it's, um, anyway. The Chitta household arose from his seat and departed without having asked Nigan to Nataputa these ten reasonable questions. And anyway, number one, it shows that it's almost like a tradition that Buddhists and Buddhist monks ask tricky questions. <laughs> but also, that even in those days, the leader of one of the great religions didn't realize just how you can be so still that no thinking happens, ceases. Anyway, just... Um, okay, I think I should probably finish there so we can actually see some old thought and examination. We've only got 10 minutes before it's 4 o'clock. So in some of these suttas I really get into. I enjoy them. I'm not, not, not sure about you, but I have an interesting time. Any questions about those suttas? One of the reasons I read them out is you know, because it shows that even in the time of the Buddha, there were great lay people. Chitta, by the way, it says in one of the other suttas that he was uh, a non-returner, just like um, Gatikara. That's why he could do these things. But anyway, that's, even in those days, monks, nuns, lay men, lay women, had great attainments. And certainly this fellow Chitta you know, understood the jhanas. And so, if he could, why can't you? The path is open. Go for it. Okay, any comment or question before? Okay, let's do a guided meditation. And also, if you think that you'd like something different for the suitors class, please let me know. And I'm willing to oblige whatever um, you want to hear in the suitor class. Might go in a bit extra. 15 minutes, is that okay for the guided meditation? Yeah, okay. That's one five, I didn't say 50. Well, no, you could do 50 if you want. So sit down, close your eyes. Just relax the body a little. Making sure that your legs are in a comfortable position. If you're sitting on a chair, you can move your legs forward, tuck them underneath the chair, move them apart. Find the best place for your own legs and feet so you are comfortable. Take an interest in your body's comfort and your body will respond by not uh, throwing you any, you might even call it tantrums. They'll be comfortable for you. You care for the body, and the body will care for you. And make sure that your butt is comfortable. Sometimes when the, you don't look after the position of your bottom on the cushion or the chair, or whatever you're sitting on, people tend to fidget later on. And that's just can be quite disturbing. Get your back feeling nice. As best you can. Because there's always aches and pains, but you look at those aches and pains and move it this way, move it that way. Lean back, lean forward, twist around until you find the most comfortable position for your own back. Just 
your shoulders. Relax. It's like you're not pulling or pushing anything. You're not stretching anything. But nothing is under any type of pressure on your body. And put your hands where they're comfortable. And don't think there is some important position they should be in. What works is what's best. Then you go up to your head, make sure your neck is not too much under strain. You can move your head forward and back or around, wherever your, your head is comfortable. Because if your head is too far forward, too far to the back, to the left, you get sort of neck aches. And lastly, your face. Be aware of the muscles in your face. Around your eyes. Mindfulness does give you feedback. So you can try scrunching up your eyes and then loosening them. You can do that. See how much you can loosen the muscles around the eyes and the muscles around the mouth. And I say that because we all know that any tightness, tension, fear, anxiety, whatever, any emotion can be read on a person's face. The muscles change. Now we're developing the emotion of peace, comfort, relaxation. So see if you can arrange those muscles so they are comfortable, peaceful, at ease. And then be aware of a whole body, just one unit, just sitting here. Just looking at the whole body, having relaxed it in parts, the whole body tends to be comfortable. But in case there is a part of the body which is irritating, or in pain. I don't know why, but I've got a little itch in my nose. So I'm going to zoom in on the irritating, most irritating part of my body. If it's you, you may have an ache somewhere, a tummy ache. You may have a sense that part of your body, there is a, a tightness, a tension there, which is weird. Zoom in on it. Make that irritation, pain, discomfort, or just imbalance in your body, the focus of your attention. I teach this to people who have cancers. They can feel the tumour, maybe in their breast or in their prostate or wherever it happens to be. After a while they can notice, they can feel there's something different there. It may not even be a pain, but it's different. You zoom in on it rather than try and ignore it. And as you zoom in, focusing, centering on the most irritating part of your body, which to me is my sinus at the moment, it's itchy. Then mindfulness does give you feedback. I experiment. Let go of fear. Let go of past and future. See if what I do, or rather how I regard that feeling, see if I can lessen its intensity. 
for me, Kapain. Zoom in on it, feel it fully. I find I can relax it. Especially if it's like a wound type pain. I notice that because of inflammation, my body overreacts and just scrunches around it. And I imagine that protective layer just expanding. The whole feeling of irritation or pain getting larger, counterintuitive. But as you expand that area of pain, it gets less dense. It actually softens. A hard ice cube, when it melts, becomes water. And as it gets hotter, it becomes steam. And it evaporates what was once a tight, hard lump. Now expands as vapor and fills the whole universe. And you can't even notice it. It's gone. It's expanded. It's freed. I like the idea, if I have an ache or a pain, of expanding it, not scrunching it and trying to get rid of it. Letting it be. Welcoming it. Ache or pain, a part of life. The body's way of dealing with injuries of dealing with sickness. A fever is nature's way of burning off those viruses or bacteria. Welcome. So I don't fight. I don't make war. I make peace. Open the door of your heart to that feeling somewhere in your body which could be a tumour, it could be a blocked artery, it could be anything. So you welcome it. Open the door of your heart with kindness. You can actually feel the ache, the pain, the imbalance get less. Soothes. You are healing yourself. Sometimes it allows energies of your body to come in. Instead of protecting that wound and stopping the body's own natural healing energies from actually doing what they've been doing for millennia in the human bodies, we block it. Now we open it. Sometimes you can feel that part of your body get warm. Great sign of energy coming up to heal that part. You feel it really relax. So peaceful. You can feel healing happening. What was once an irritation, now softened less intense. And that encourages you to keep on with this zooming in and giving kindness in this moment. If you find the irritation or pain get worse, get stronger, sharper, You've obviously been going in the wrong direction. Just stop, try something else. Let this moment be. Even surrender to it. Stop fighting. Make peace, not war. We find this feeling, this pain, irritation. 
can get less intense. It is getting less intense. Follow that path. Like the simile I said this morning, of to escape from danger, you follow the streams which lead in the right direction. And me lost in the mountain, it was going downhill. You follow this change in your attitude to what you're experiencing. Letting it be, being kind, being gentle. And you feel that the air of the body, which was irritating, even in pain, you actually feel the pain get less, the irritation get less. When I was a kid and used to fall on the, the street, bang soccer, I would run to my mother and she would kiss my grazed knee with her, with her mouth. The pain would go away immediately. She would call it kissing it better. So I learned the power of kindness to relax, take away aches and pains. My mother has passed away. The lesson remains. I give kindness to my own body, as my mother once did to her child. And any ache or pain is reduced, reduced and reduced, and often it totally disappears. And I stay with my body. So relaxed, the peace, delightful. I'm going to be quiet for just a couple of minutes.
open your eyes to come out of the meditation. The body awareness meditation. I've used that when I got sick. Sometimes you can read these stories in these books. I try not to keep them quiet. I, when I had food poisoning, it was very painful food poisoning. So it was in my cave. In 20 minutes or 30 minutes, I can't remember what. But I was, you know, in spasms, shrieking in pain. And they just calmed the whole thing down. After 20 minutes, 30 minutes, my intestines were perfect. No problems. Weird, but it's a very nice thing to be able to do. Well, the time when I was in Korea, just about to go, half an hour to go on national TV, and I had a cold. And this yucky stuff was coming out of my nose. You know, the, I don't know what the real word is, we used to call it snot. Not a very nice word, but there it was. And just no medication, don't carry medication. So, meditation, that's what I carry. <laughs> and then just relax it, relax it, relax it, relax it, relax it. And then you can face the camera and it's easy. No cold. Imagine what you can do with your own body when you train it. To feel the sensations and just really relax them so deeply. So a lot of the aches and pains just go. Anyway, that's for you to experiment with. And who knows? But what's you know, really sort of amazing, you do that with people with stuff like cancers. Got a cancer group go coming in next week on the 18th, just coming to visit. So that's the sort of thing which I teach them. You can feel that like, it's this terrible thing having things like breast cancers, but you can catch it so early. You feel there's something wrong there, wrong or imbalanced or different. You just focus, kindness, relax it to the max. Amazing what you can do. So this stuff is really powerful. Okay. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. <laughs> yeah. Okay.